Britain's new Labour government has suspended some arms exports to Israel over human rights concerns, allegedly based on the same legal advice that David Cameron had sat on for months when he was Foreign Secretary. I'm joined now by a former government insider who knows what it's like to be in the room with David Cameron having these debates about whether or not the UK should export arms to Israel. Sir Vince Cable, great to meet you. Thank you. We're here today at the Liberal Democrat Conference in Brighton amid celebration of the party's gains at the last election. But I'd like to cast your mind back 10 years to when you were business secretary and David Cameron was prime minister in the coalition government. And uh, Israel was once again at war in Gaza. Um, thousands of Palestinians were being killed, including hundreds of children. And you found yourself, in theory at least, responsible or in charge of UK arms exports to Israel. What was it like being in that position? Uh, well, it was very difficult. As, as you say, I had overall responsibility for arms export licensing, but it was obviously you had a collective government response. Uh, we had to have the approval of the Defence Secretary, the Foreign Secretary, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and I was having to navigate between them. Um, during the first Gaza war, uh, the issues were rather similar to what they are at the moment, but obviously on a smaller scale and within a much shorter time frame. Um, what we were having to balance was Israel's right to defend itself, and it was being attacked by missiles from the Gaza Strip, uh, and the fact that the Israeli response, which was fighter aircraft uh, you know, attacking settlements, w w which we eventually judged was disproportionate. Um, and I took the view that we therefore had to suspend licenses, and we did so. Um, there was quite a tortuous process of negotiation in government, but we did agree that this is where we had to go. Um, and we proceeded with it, but by then the fighting stopped, so it, it became um, a redundant decision. When David Cameron came back into government as Foreign Secretary under Rishi Sunak, some people thought he might take a more assertive stance um, towards what Israel was doing in Gaza on the arms export front, but it seems like he, he had very similar legal advice to what David Lammy had now. Um, and he took the decision not to suspend arms exports. Given your experience of, of dealing with him in government, did that come as a surprise? Uh, well, I was surprised it took so long to come to a decision, I mean, because clearly the operation was on a much bigger scale, a lot more people were being killed, uh, but equally the Hamas provocation was, was it much more serious. So, in a way, it was the, 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 the same kind of dilemma we had to deal with, but on a much more intense scale. But I'm, I'm surprised. I mean, had I still been in government, I would have expected to have had the advice at a fairly early stage that, that you know, we should be considering suspending licences. There was a clear risk that the weapons the UK supplied could be used by Israel to violate international humanitarian law, but both now and in 2014. Yes, well, in 2014, I said there's a balance of factors. I think in most cases, the presumption... Uh, was to support continuing supply. I had many other very difficult decisions involving weapon sales to, you know, Russia. Uh, actually, the sort of grey area, which is the most difficult and one. Dual use type Dual stuff. use. There's a lot of dual use controversies, and I found myself on some occasions supporting supply and in other cases opposing it. Um, dual use is a... But I don't think that was really an issue in the... Uh, Gaza conflict, it was very clear what the weapons were and how they were being delivered. Um, it was just a very slow governmental response, I mean, almost a year before they made it in their mind. I mean, actually, government can work much quicker than that. While you were trying to reach that consensus, um, quite late in the day, Baroness Saida Vazi, who was a cabinet minister, resigned in protest, saying the government hadn't done enough. Uh, she's obviously on the, was on the conservative side. Um, I know yourself and Nick Clegg were pushing on the, from the Lib Dem side of the coalition. What was it like, that kind of dynamic of trying to persuade people like David Cameron to, you know, actually stop some arms exports to Israel? Well, we have been attacked by both sides with equal um, bitterness, actually. You know, the Israelis felt we were being totally unreasonable because Israel had the right to defend itself, etc. Uh, we were accused of being anti-Israeli prejudice. And we were also attacked from the Palestinian side that we weren't doing enough quickly enough and Baroness Wasi and we were sort of caught in the middle of the crossfire. And the fact that we were attacked from both sides with roughly equal force uh, rather confirmed my view that we were probably in the right place. Obviously, on one side, there'd be groups like Campaign Against Arms Trade, Palestine Solidarity Campaign. 
on the other side, I know in David Cameron's autobiography, he refers to Stuart Pollack, the director of Conservative Friends of Israel, as having a very formative impact on his view on the Middle East. What, what kind of role did those kind of groups, do you think, have on particularly the Conservative front bench? Uh, well, I wasn't aware of the things going on behind the scenes because the responsibility of government uh, in this kind of situation is very much tied up with legal requirements. Uh, we were operating under arms export licensing law, which is based, was at that stage anyway European, um, and we were just having to make sure that we were compliant. So in, in a way, for me, it was a largely internal decision. There was quite strong pushback. Um, mainly from the Ministry of Defence, uh, Foreign Secretary, not just David Cameron. Um, but as you rightly say, Nick Clegg supported my position that we needed to cease the licences. But I wasn't aware of the, you know, the underground operations. It was um, in the department we were trying to comply with the law. Uh, and there was a you know, very honest debate between ministers. Another thing towards the, the end of your time as Business Secretary in 2015, that happened was Saudi Arabia began bombarding Yemen using lots of British supplied equipment. And quite quickly it became apparent that there were many civilian casualties as a result of these airstrikes. What was it like being business secretary in, in that situation? Well, in many ways, this was a more difficult uh, set of decisions than related to the uh, Gaza conflict. Um, because with, with, there was clear evidence coming from um, Médecins Sans Frontières and various other organizations that hospitals were being bombed um, by the Saudi Air Force. Um, there was a clear human rights humanitarian issue involved. British bombs were being resupplied. Um, and I took the view that, that we had to suspend the license. Uh, it was very strongly uh, opposed by uh, colleagues in the coalition, particularly Minister of Defence, who took the view that we had a, a, you know, a moral and commercial commitment to continue supply Saudi Arabia, which was seen as an ally, source of intelligence, um, major contractor for you know British jobs and so on. So there was very strong resistance, um, and all of course this was occurring in the last few days of the coalition government. Um, but I, I did make a decision to suspend the licenses, but as a result of the debate taking place in government, what we finished up with a compromise, which was that um, British um, armed forces personnel located in Saudi Arabia would be put in the Saudi war room, and they would oversee what was happening. And on that basis, I eventually agreed to let uh, some of the weapons supply go. Um, what surprised me and worried me and disappointed me is that when we left government, um, the, our successors dis dis disclaimed all knowledge of this agreement, which had actually been reached in writing with the Defence Secretary. When that came to light, you, you said you felt you'd been seriously misled. Um, and the MOD sort of said, well, there are people in the Air Operations Centre somewhere in the building, but they're not involved in targeting, perhaps because they thought that might make them... Uh, liable for breaches of international law? Yes, well, what I'd been told was that the Americans had very tight control over how their weapons were being used. And I said, well, at the very least, the British should have operate in the same disciplined way. And we weren't. Um, and I was disappointed and worried when uh, the agreement we had reached was effectively forgotten about. And I think you hinted at in one of your previous answers the role that some of these big uh, contractors can play in, in government policy. So with the Saudi uh, arms exports, BAE systems make up the majority of that multi-billion pound contracts with the Saudi government to supply Typhoon aircraft. Do you think sometimes that these big companies, be they arms firms, oil companies, I know you had chief economist at Shell at one point, they can have not just an influence, but perhaps too much influence on, on government policy towards foreign affairs and, and arms exports? Well, you know, we could argue that both ways, but actually the issue in the Saudi case was, was a contract that had been reached in the days of Margaret Thatcher, it was the Al Yamama contract. And there's a lot being written and said about it and the conditions under which the contract was secured. Uh, but what it's meant was that 
you know, hundreds of millions of pounds, billions of pounds of contracts have been lined up for British exporters. And it isn't just the interests of the companies, you know, their employees. I mean, I, you know, visited the factories where, you know, hundreds, thousands of highly skilled British manufacturing workers were employed and it was their job. So it, it, they, it wasn't a simple good versus bad, bosses versus workers. I mean, the, you know, a lot of British livelihoods depended on these arms contracts. And of course, now the, um, these 30 arms export licenses have been suspended to Israel. Um, they include some fighter jet components for the F-16, but not for the F-35, which is Israel's most advanced fighter jet. And the rear fuselage is made by BAE systems in the north of England. Around 15% of the aircraft is made in, in the UK by various British companies. Why do you think the government stopped short of suspending those F-35 licenses? Is it because of this role, perhaps, of BAE Systems or the special relationship with the US, given that they, you know, it's a joint project to make this aircraft with, with, with the Americans? I honestly don't know. I'm not in government. I'm not across the details, so I, there's no point in my making comments on it. All I do remember is that when we suspended the licenses originally, I had to get involved in a, you know, part by part, debate with the defense secretary about which we could authorize and which we shouldn't. And I remember being on my summer holiday in France, wandering around some ruins, trying to uh, debate with the defense secretary about which particular component should be allowed and which it shouldn't. So that was the kind of detail we were getting into. But as for the recent contra, I, I, there's no point in my adding comment. I'm, I'm not across the detail. Okay. Thank you very much, Vince Cable. Okay. Lovely to meet you. Thanks. If you're watching this video and you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please press the button below. You can also help Declassified do more investigations like this by donating to our work via the Super Thanks button or by joining Declassified from £3 a month. Thanks for watching.